Welcome, friends. Welcome to another edition of Freeing the Body, Freeing the Soul. I'm your host, Dr. David, the Cutting Edge Doc, and here on Freeing the Body, Freeing the Soul, we do in-depth interviews with individuals that are doing cutting-edge work in the areas of healing, spirituality, and social transformation. I'm very excited about today's show. We're going to be doing this show both in audio and video, so I plan to upload this to my YouTube channel Mm -hmm. as well. So this is going to be one of those turn the table shows where I'm going to be being interviewed. Today I'm going to be being interviewed by my student and dear friend Maureen Xavier. And uh, she's really, in some way, she's really responsible for bringing this show into existence because she requested the opportunity to interview me about a subject matter that's dear to both of our hearts, which is transformation. Uh, Maureen is getting much more involved professionally in in transformation and uh, both for her own personal and professional growth and because she's so passionate about transformation and wants to preserve the integrity of transformation and the possibility and the power that real transformation is, she asked if she could interview me on the topic. And so here we are. I'm going to turn the show over to Maureen. So I'm in Maureen's hands and then she'll turn it over back to me when she's finished and I will formally close out the show. So Maureen, take it away. Hi, well, thank you, Dr. David, and thank you, viewers. I really appreciate the opportunity um, to be of service in many ways, and I'm most interested, actually, well, I just want to give a little bit of information about more about me, is I've been a student of Dr. David's for six years, and when I showed up in his room, I was in pretty bad shape, and I knew there was something different about him as soon as I walked in. And he's facilitated a lot of growth and possibility in me and being a servant leader. And in the space that I am right now is I'm starting to work with people. um, And I honestly don't know how to introduce transformation to them in layman's language. I've lived in it. I'm living in it. And I would, like to ha- I would like to explain to the viewers and to get a better understanding myself of exactly what is transformation. What is the context that Dr. David works in? So to start, so, so that is the space that I am providing here. I also have, I also will give the viewers a little taste of what transformation is like to work in that space and and discuss any other things that may arise as we as the interview unfolds. So thank you again, Dr. David, for allowing me to interview you. That being said, so Dr. David, for the for the person who sees transformation all over the place on everything, what is your definition of transformation? What is the space that you work in with yourself and with the clients that you serve? Well, you asked me a bunch of questions there. Maybe we could take them one at a time. Okay. So what is trans- what is the definition of transformation for you? I look at transformation in a few from a few different angles. Um, I look at transformation as a particular technology. Um, that involves a particular method of inquiry where we are asking questions and living inside of questions in a particular way that we're not taught in our culture. Uh, In our culture, we're taught to ask questions and listen for and look for the right answer as if there was one right answer. And that's one way to deal with questions. And in certain domains, that way of being with questions works pretty well. Uh, But there are other domains where that way of working with questions doesn't work 
will at all. And transformation has to do with an arena where working with those, working with questions where you're looking for the right answer doesn't work at all. So transformation as a technology for inquiry is really valuable when you want to inquire into what you don't know you don't know. That is a realm that we as a culture, we don't know very much about that. And what you don't know you don't know has a huge impact on both the quality of your life and your effectiveness in life. And most Americans, which, you know, it's probably true for other cultures as well, but my experience over the last 40 plus years has been dealing primarily with people who've been kind of thrown a certain way in the American culture. And as far as the American culture goes, we don't know very much about that world. And we also don't even know that we don't know very much about that world. We're like blind to that world. It's like there's a whole domain, there's a whole world that we don't know that we don't know about. And what if the knowing about that could make a huge difference for us? And so it's kind of like what spiritual teachers have attempted to do for thousands of years. <clears throat> They've attempted to interact with people that are in the world that have worldly concerns. And they've attempted to somehow touch these people in such a way that they can be more effective in dealing with their worldly concerns. But the realm in which they're inviting people to explore is a realm that most people cannot access using their normal ways of being and their normal ways of knowing and their normal ways of asking questions, and their normal ways of being. And so spiritual teachers throughout the ages have explored different ways of trying to build a bridge between uh, a, a spiritual teacher who is living and embodying uh, a spacious, a unifying kind of realization with the person in the world who is not. And so one way of looking at transformation is that it's a technology and a set of distinctions and a set of skills that tends to allow that bridge to be built much faster and much more predictably. So I look at transformation as a technology especially a method of inquiry. And I also look at transformation as a possibility. I also look at it as um, a certain presence, a certain way of being and living. Um, it tends to come alive for human beings in the space of language, of conversation. Um, one of the things that makes uh, transformation has a lot to do with ontology, has a lot to do with the study and the science of being, as opposed to, <clears throat> say, the science of the mind or philosophy, the study of ideas, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, transformation is very much related to ontology, the study of being, and ontological inquiry. Uh, many people have tried to get at this. Like I said, spiritual teachers throughout the ages, a uh, famous philosopher in the early part of the 20th century, Martin Heidegger, uh, wrote a classic book on being in time in German where he attempted to get at this issue of being and that people were stuck in a way of being that they didn't know they were being that was shaping and constraining everything. And he became very frustrated because he didn't 
he wasn't successful except for a few people maybe in building that bridge that he wanted to build and eventually got pretty jaded and frustrated and basically kind of gave up toward the end of his life and just kind of in an exasperated way just said well maybe the poets maybe maybe it should be left up to the poets to to try to build that bridge and my way of interpreting what heidegger was saying is that he wasn't able to get people out of their conceptual way of looking at the subject matter and that a poet a really good poem brings forth the presence of something rather than thinking about it or talking about it and so you know that's a little bit closer to transformation is when you're in the presence of something as opposed to thinking about it but transformation goes beyond that as well you know there's a lot of people that have been in the presence of something like i'm sure you've been to a athletic performance or or a dance performance or a musical performance and you've been transported into moments of ecstatic states where you've been in the presence of greatness you've had it you know but there, most of those people will go back to their day-to-day -day concerns and day-to-day -day lives and other than that being a really cool experience for most people that doesn't make that much of a difference in what happens monday morning when they go to work or in their parenting so I think Heidegger was on the right track saying, well, maybe we should leave it up to the poets because he was saying, hey, you know, this is a, we're talking about something that's beyond a concept, but it's not enough. I mean, back in the 70s, many people had LSD experiences where they were in the presence of profound understanding and realization, but as they came down off the drug, their ego structures and ego patterns and ego activity would reconstruct itself and they wouldn't know what to do with that experience, with the being in the presence of that awareness. They wouldn't know what to do with it. They weren't able to integrate it. Hardly anyone, you know, very, very few people were able to integrate that in a way that led to continual increased possibility and self-expression. So, Transformation goes beyond being in the presence of something. It goes to what we would call possibility, living in a space of possibility that even allows for the presence of something to emerge, but it's senior to presence, it's senior to concepts, it's senior to form, it's senior to structure, and yet it allows for all of those things. So another way of describing transformation or talking about transformation that's useful in my experience <clears throat> is to say that transformation is a shift in one's fundamental sense of being an identity from being a finite thing, being a position, being something to being an infinite space of possibility that allows one to interact with all positions and all structures and all processes and time and space and history and the body and the mind and the past and the future in a way that creates a sacred quality to one's life. It dignifies one's life. It takes the mundane and creates a sacred context for what we normally would consider the mundane stuff of life and sanctifies and make sacred and allows for the true dignity and worth of the individual to come forth in the 
in the challenges of day-to-day -day human experience, life experience. So it doesn't take away from being human. It doesn't take away from the content of one's life. It doesn't take away from the structures of one's life. It doesn't take away from one's wonderful experiences or mundane experiences or challenging experiences. It doesn't try to necessarily change anything. It just provides a holy or sacred frame for being and for living. And then out of that knowingness of infinite spaciousness, one can create a space for themselves to live into, into the world that actually enlivens their living and tends to have an uplifting impact on others. And it's not an easy path in the sense that as human beings, when we live transformation into our lives, what we come up against is we come up against the limitations and dysfunctional ways of being and structures that have correlated with living in the past from an untransformed space. And so people first encounter that usually in relation to their individuality, their own psychology, their own body, their own thought patterns, and their own way of being with their emotions, and the stories they're telling themselves, and all of that. And so, in the beginning, what tends to be present for people as they commit to living transformation is a lot of blockages in the area of their individuality. And with the proper support, of a guide and a community and a valid teaching, if people stay with it, what will predictably happen is they'll get in good enough shape as a being that the next thing that they start becoming aware of is the dysfunctionality in their relationships. And then that whole dynamic of uh, begins again at a different level of the spiral. And of course, that's a little more complex because now you have not only to deal with all the things you were dealing with yourself as an individual, but then there's a whole other level of skill set and distinctions to master that have to do with successful and powerful relationships. And then what tends to happen if people will stay with it, and that's a big if. A lot of people don't stay with the transformational journey because it requires such an enormous amount of commitment and courage in a world as we have today. But if you stay with it and you get your relationships in pretty good shape, then what tends to happen is the next rung of that spiral is they people start to become aware of the dysfunctionality in the groups and organizations in which they are participating or would consider participating. And then there's a whole new set of learning of how to be in such a way that you can bring forth and impact groups and organizations that can handle the truth, that can handle transformed human beings that can handle transformed relationships. And then if you're skillful enough and lucky enough to, to be a part of an organization that's actually living transformation, then what you come up against is the dysfunctionality in our culture, the systems and institutions uh, that make up our culture, our civilization. And this is where some people just kind of go on tilt. This is like where they kind of get off the bus. 
It's like, okay, that's a little too much for me. Now I'm just going to, you know, be part of my group and, uh, you know, create a little parallel universe that works better. And that's fine. And that's fine. There's no judgment there. However, if someone wants to keep playing a bigger game, then what they come up against is all the dysfunctionality that ego-based consciousness has reflected as our culture. And of course, that culture reflects back on individuals. So it's kind of a vicious circle. And I think in many ways, uh, that confrontation with our whole society, the whole socio-political economic implications of living transformation at the level of culture is such a huge thing to look at. It's such a high gradient confront for most people that when most people attempt from a non-transformed space to confront cultural change like social action, so like people who want to engage in social action, you know, there's probably one tenth of one tenth of one percent of social activists that are really living transformation at this level. So most social activism, in my opinion, is doomed to fail from the start because people haven't done the work that's necessary at an individual level and relationship level and group level to really be in a space of being able to confront being responsible for and living transformation at the level of culture. Uh, and one of the things that's really interesting is that right now, as we do this recording in late June of 2017, uh, the entire American culture is at its late stage of cultural breakdown. And so it's a very interesting time for those of us that have been living transformation for a while, because, you know, if you're living in a culture where everything is going great and the ideas and the agreements and the institutions of a culture are really serving the well-being and aliveness of the people in the culture, we don't even have to pay that much attention to transformation at the cultural level because it's kind of things are kind of working but it's when things are really breaking down and things are really in sharp relief that it really you know draws your attention and one of the things that's kind of interesting is that if you are a really committed mature light worker transformation person not only do you tend to pay attention to these things, which is very challenging because it's very easy to get depressed and things like that, but the other thing is that your actual presence actually catalyzes much of this uh, bringing things to the surface. And so I'm reminded of the famous line in the Bible that many people do not understand the meaning of. Uh, when Jesus says, I come not as a peacemaker, I come as a sword. Many people don't understand what he was saying there. But what he was saying there is he was saying, you know, my, my living transformation, my light is so powerful that it exposes the dysfunctionality at every level of human existence. And some people will be up to looking at that and will love the opportunity to grow and to heal. And other people will be so committed to ego-based consciousness or to serving the dark side that they will run away or try to kill me or this or that. And he was very aware of the impact of his transformational presence at the cultural level. He knew that he was creating a lot of rock and roll. He knew that there would be a couple thousand years before there would be a, a, a likely opportunity for individuals to really live the possibility that he was anchoring into the planet. So 
one of the things that's very important for someone who's living transformation is to live this seeming paradox of total commitment and total non-attachment. Because if you look at Jesus's life, it's a great example of that. He was completely committed to his mission, his goals, his purposes, and yet he was unattached to the results in his lifetime there as Jesus. And uh, he was very aware. He knew enough about the universe and about rhythms and cycles and things. He was very aware that it was highly unlikely that there would be a, a, f a fuller realization of his teachings for over 2,000 years, and yet it didn't keep him from showing up the way he was showing up. And so one of the things that I've had to get better at, if I was going to stay in, in the transformation game, has been to really get better at this total commitment, total non-attachment thing. Because I'm very aware that there's a high likelihood that by the time I leave my body in this incarnation, that maybe transformation will only be really lived in a rich way in small enclaves, small communities, small, et cetera. But yet, I'm not attached to that. That doesn't deter me from my commitment and my enthusiasm and my joy. So there's a lot of ways that I look at transformation. And, you know, one of my pet peeves is, and why I wanted to do this interview is that the word is thrown around so loosely right now that it's losing its power. And, um, and that's a concern to me. It's very easy. You know, if you look at the way the dark side operates, one of their favorite ways to operate is to take words, to take definitions, to take words and then change the agreement uh, by usage of how that word is used. And it's very confusing to people. I mean, you know, if you look at the New Age movement, you know, back in the late 60s and early to mid 70s, uh, there was a lot of truth that was coming through the New Age movement. And as time went on, it became commercialized and twisted and distorted to the point where by the 90s, I would say the New Age movement had been infiltrated with so many false ideas and distortions that it was actually, it was really a mixed bag. And uh, people were, uh, people were getting uh, very often damaged uh, by a lot of partial teachings. And so one of the ways that the dark forces work is by taking something that can be potentially beautiful and then distorting it. In fact, that's the main way that the dark side works. So for example, taking something beautiful like food or family or sexuality or um, learning or something like that and then distorting it where learning becomes indoctrination or sexuality instead of being used for healing and communication and spiritual growth is used for everything but that, is used for manipulation and domination, et cetera, et cetera. Or where food, which could be used for communion with the earth and for joyous celebration and fellowship, is basically used for genetic manipulation and frequency jamming. So it goes on and on and on. And so one of the things that is very important is to be able to be in the space where I am now, where I can see all these things and I can talk about all these things and I'm not getting depressed and I'm not going into judgment and I'm not wanting to kill anybody, uh, where it just is part of my knowledge base. It's I'm big enough to include all of this and to have compassion and to understand the nature of free will and to understand how that all works. But um, it's quite a journey and if that journey has any chance of succeeding, if you're going to be living and using transformation in order to build that bridge to what you want to be being, 
we, it's so important to understand what you mean when you say, I am committed to, to living transformation. And, um, and I, therefore I see most people that claim that they're providing transformational services, actually they're not. And, you know, that, that definitely slows things down in terms of what I would like to see happen. So, you know, I've just kind of been riffing on your question a little bit, kind of uh, exploring it from some different aspects. But another thing I would say about your question is that in my career, I have found it not necessary to explain transformation to potential clients. Uh, I find that it doesn't do very much good because of what I was saying, that if you're trying to explain it, the listener is going to try to listen from their current frame of reference and it can't fit it. So I don't, I don't try to explain transformation to my clients. I, I, my commitment is to live transformation and to meet people where they are and to discover what their concerns are what their interests are and to speak honestly and powerfully to their concerns. And once I gain their trust and they are maybe um, out of danger, so to speak, they're not, their world isn't caving in on them so much. And they could become a little more interested in greater possibilities. Then I might start introducing some transformational distinctions and some transformational models and some kind of transformational inquiry. But even at that point, I might do all that without even using the word transformation. Because partially because of what I've been talking about, mm -hmm. that the word has become so bastardized that um, I, I haven't found it that useful. So when you say you really want to be able to explain it to people, I would suggest to take a look at that. Do you really want to explain it to people? Or is there something else you're really wanting and maybe there's another way to go about having what it is that you're really wanting? Okay. Thank you so much. Wow, that was a wealth of information and I ended up having even so many even more questions than I thought I would have. Um, I'd encourage you to go with that, you know, go with, go with the questions you actually have that are really present for you because. Well, so first of all, um, so first of all, for, for the, for the viewer here that comes across lots of people who say they're transformational coaches. How do they, what tools would you give them to discern for themselves whether a person's a tr operating in a transformational mode that you just described to us as being a space of possibility and building, being able to build a bridge for another person to be able to live into that space too, or they're living something else? I would say two things. One, ask them what they mean by that. Ask the practitioner what that means to them. Okay. And then the other thing I would say is pay attention to your experience of when you're actually being in the presence of the other person. Like you mentioned when you started the interview, you said when you came into my treatment room or my office the first time, you, you, you felt that you were in the presence of somebody that there was just something that was a little different. Mm -hmm. And so, I would say those two things is really pay attention to your direct experience and also ask the question, you know, um, one of the things I've noticed in American life is that most people don't ask very powerful questions. Most people don't either ask questions or the questions they ask are questions the answer to which wouldn't make a very big difference anyway. And so, you know, 
there's a lot of truth to the adage that the quality of your life is correlated to a large extent by the quality of the questions that you ask and how you be with those questions. And definitions are very, very important. I mentioned earlier how one of the ways that the dark side operates is to take the original meaning of a word and to twist it. Because we think in language, we think using words. And so if you want to distort somebody's perceptions, one good way to do that is to distort the way they think. And a great way to do that is to twist the meaning of words. And so I would ask a person, if they claim to be a transformational guide, if they, tend, if they claim to be a transformational coach, if they tend to be a trans, if they claim to be a transformational counselor, ask them, say, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? What is a transformational counselor? Mm -hmm. Just like you kind of asked me today, mm -hmm. you know, what is transformation? Mm -hmm. You know, and if the person starts verbally vomiting all over your question, that's probably <laughs> a pretty good indicator. <laughs> that you might want to run the other way. <laughs> okay. You know, it, it, words tend to go in and out of fashion. Uh, you know, at, at, at a more superficial level of culture, words tend to go in and out of fashion. So who knows? Maybe transformation will be out of fashion in three years, and maybe it'll be in again three years later. But uh, those are two suggestions that I have. Okay, thank you. So the other thing that popped up to me in the very beginning of your answer was the space of not knowing what they don't know. Well, my personal relationship with knowing and learning and not knowing and not learning has been a really tumultuous ride. I've had threat I've had threats on both ways. So I could see that being well, terrifying to anyone who is being used by their ego that doesn't realize it, which is most of the world today. But yeah, I'm so I'm just saying how so I think this would be a good time to bridge the gap to help people understand what it's really like to to go to where you describe to help people get into knowing to becoming aware of what they don't know that they don't know. So I'd like to give people a, a practical experience of what that's like for them in a way so they don't, so they don't like freak out and run, run, run the other way just because they're so afraid of either knowing something or not knowing something. Well, I think one thing that's really important is to consider the possibility of making it okay with yourself to not know and to make it okay with yourself that you don't know you don't know that you know you don't know something uh, the public school system is basically not an educational system it's basically a system of indoctrination for people to accept arbitrary authority and therefore people are trained into looking for the one right answer and are rewarded if they give the answer that the authority wants. And if they give no answer or an answer that the authority doesn't want, they get um, punished. And uh, so that's just basically classical conditioning, the way you would condition an animal. You know, they're treated like animals. Children are treated like animals in, uh, when they're being indoctrinated and we've been indoctrinated. And so if we can get that we've been indoctrinated and we can move past our immediate emotional reaction to it, and we can just be with the is of it that we have been indoctrinated. That's the first step in becoming free is recognizing the prison in which we have been indoctrinated. And so, one aspect of the prison in which we've been indoctrinated is the idea that it's not okay not to know. 
and it's not okay psychologically to know you don't know that somehow that's anxiety producing mm -hmm. imagine getting to the place where it's actually exciting for you when you discover that you don't know something that's the world i live in if i am interested in something and i'm exploring a field or a subject matter and I realize there's something I don't know, and I'm curious about it, I get excited because it's obvious to me that it's in the structural nature of the universe that if you are really curious and wanting to expand your knowledge in a certain area, that you're going to come up against things you don't know. And that's just the way it is. It can't be any other way. And so if you can make peace with that and turn that to your advantage and become curious about that and have that become part of your inquiry, that, that really makes life a lot more fun and you become a lot more effective and a lot more intelligent. Your intelligence, your natural intelligence can come forth a lot easier if you can live in that space of wonder where instead of becoming anxious if you know you don't know something, it can engender a state of wonder and curiosity and innocent perception, um, a beginner's mind, so to speak. So I would say that's the most valuable thing I could say to a listener who is uh, flirting with the idea of getting involved in some kind of transformational process or inquiry is imagine the possibility what it might be like or feel like or sense if you were actually living in such a way where you allowed yourself to be naturally curious about something and you pursued learning about it and you came up against something you don't know and maybe it was something you didn't even know you didn't know but now you know you don't know it where that that engenders a state of wonder excitement curiosity like cool um, if you can create a little space for yourself from your indoctrination with the educational system and you can let go of these crazy crazy rules of having to be perfect before you start out on your journey you can then, now you've created a little space for yourself to really learn, to really be, to really live, and to welcome confusion, to welcome seeming paradox, because that just tells you that you're coming up to the limits of your old paradigm. It doesn't mean that you're stupid. It just means you're coming up to the limits of your existing paradigm. And so another big part of transformation is becoming aware of and taking responsibility for the stories that you're living inside. So that was an example of a story that somebody might be living inside. That, oh, they're stupid. And then if they come up, if they start experiencing confusion or they come up to a paradox, then the ego will use that to justify that story. Oh yeah, that yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm too stupid for this. I'm gonna abdicate my own intelligence, my own awareness, and I'm just gonna default to uh, the authorities, which is exactly the way you were indoctrinated. So I would say altering your relationship to what you don't know to the point where knowing you don't know something uh, actually catalyzes positive emotion is really, really important, really important. And uh, to introduce that possibility to people the way I've introduced it to you in the last 10 minutes can be a very powerful conversation for someone. Well, and what I've learned from working with you is that everything starts as a question. Questions are what introduce people to the subject. And what I feel like I want to interject in this is for anybody who finds themselves coming up against 
fear of knowing or a fear of not knowing would be to ask themselves the question, what if I were, what if I were willing to know that I don't know? What if that was okay with me? What if I were willing to accept and allow myself to not know and to not know that I don't, to, to know that I don't know? So yeah, there's that, like, that's, that's like the whole starting point for someone who's not been introduced to the method of inquiry that I have to, to put it themselves into, because I, I, I could see where even going to the place of imagining that you introduced to people. I know when I was in your presence, I was threatened and I wouldn't even go there. I was the, the whole imagining of that was threatening to me. So first of all, you have to be willing. And then sometimes it's even scary to be willing. So asking myself the question is what if I was willing and see what that owes was, see what's possible there. What that could, willing that to could know? work what or if that willing to not know. That could work or that could even be too high a gradient for people. It okay. might it might be better work better to start with where they are. So if where they are is really afraid of not knowing or okay. really afraid of knowing, it might be more useful to just ask a question about that. You know, like 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 what's really scary to you about not knowing? What's really scary to you about knowing you don't know something? What's scary to you about looking inside and seeing something and knowing something? Because their fears around not knowing and not knowing are totally based on all the stories they've made up about knowing and not knowing. So it might work better and be lower gradient and might meet them more where they are. Okay. If, you're, if you're dealing with a person who has no experience with transformation, to just meet people right where they are, which is they are in their fear of knowing and or their fear of not knowing and just invite them to see if they're willing to take a look at, you know, what they might be afraid of in those areas. And you can set up sentence completion exercises. There's different ways. So what I'd like to do because we're on this subject is I'd like to go there instead of let's just talking around the subject. Mm -hmm. Let's actually do that. Would you be willing to play that with me right now? Sure, you could do, like we could do a sentence completion. You could pretend to be a new person in to exploring this. And I teach you how to do sentence completions, which I'm not gonna take the time to do now, so that you're doing it in a way that can work. And then you're just completing the stem maybe six to 12 times. Um, one of the scary things about looking inside and and knowing something about myself might be blank. So one of the bad or scary things about knowing something about myself might be I, that I wouldn't be my mother, that I wouldn't be enough for my mother to know. You know what? We froze. He froze for a minute there. Let me see if yeah. I can close, let me see if I can close down some windows here. Yeah. Yeah. So all my windows are closed down now, except for yours. So this is the best I can do. Okay. Let's continue. Okay. Um, let's just do one, one of the about let's do one of the scary things about looking inside myself might be blank one of the bad or scary things about looking inside myself might be that i will know way more than i think i do and that will be really scary to me because then i'll have to do something about it okay so just to stop you there for the listeners and the viewers so what's happening is we've unearthed a major story that this person is living inside. They're living inside a story that they are a victim of their own knowledge, that if they knew something, therefore they would have to do this or have to do that. So obviously, if you're living inside that story, you're not going to relish knowing more because it'll be correlated with the feeling of increased pressure 
of having to do something. So that's a great example of how just meeting the person where they are and teaching them how to do sentence completion exercises. If we were really doing sentence completions, we'd probably do about six to 12 of them. But just doing one of them starts to expose what the person probably didn't know they didn't know that was having a huge impact on their life. And in this case, the thing that it's exposing is that they're living a story that says, it's really scary to look inside and know things because if I know something, then I have to fill in the blank. So when you're living that story, instead of knowledge becoming an empowering tool that gives you more choices, now you're living a completely opposite story that knowing something gives you less choices and gives you more pressure. And so if you're living that story and you don't know you're living that story, your capacity for transformational inquiry is going to be really limited and you're probably going to quit and then go back to your favorite addiction probably within 48 hours. And that's just one story that emerged from one sentence completion round. It's from, from just one, one, one answer. And if I were coaching somebody, that would bring up enough material for, for us to work on for the whole coaching session. Mm -hmm. But the only way that that happened was by engaging you at an appropriate gradient. Yep. Thank you very much. I think that that was a good taste of what it's like to get in to the transformational inquiry realm that builds a bridge that built a bridge between my reaction of you saying you don't know what you don't know although i've heard it thousands of times before still having a threat and it still triggered me because i've still been being something in relation to knowing that i didn't know before Right. So that was a good taste of not just talking about transformational inquiry, but that was a night that was an act, you know, not just talking about it, but that was a good taste of it. So if you could imagine living that way, if you could imagine like where I'm listening to you from, if you could imagine me listening that way in my life. Mm -hmm to my own stories, to other people's stories, to cultural stories. Mm -hmm. um, that could give you a taste for the possibility that we're talking about. And so it's a big game. It's a, you know, in game theory, they talk about two categories of games. They talk about finite games and infinite games. And the ego can understand finite games, but the ego cannot understand infinite games. It's not designed to relate to infinity, which is really a problem since you are an infinite being. <laughs> so, uh, so, so the transformation game is an infinite game. It's sometimes referred to the master game, where it doesn't have an end. It's a different kind of game. It's a game where you can be wholly committed to it right now, and there can be an infinity of expansion available to you. Mm -hmm. And even the, the, even contemplating the possibility of playing an infinite game is very catalytic yeah. because, it, because it brings up what people are being that is correlated with being that they are finite, which is just about everything. <laughs> yeah. So, <clears throat> 
So the big challenge for someone who is really living transformation committedly is what you're getting at here, which is sort of the theme of this conversation so far, which is how do you become an effective bridge builder? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, that's exactly what yeah. brought this up. Uh, you know, I mean, one way of looking at it is you could, again, let's go back and look at Jesus as an as a object lesson. So here was a being that knew his infinite nature. He knew the infinite nature of everyone. And he knew his mission to anchor a a new possibility, a new set of frequencies onto the planet. He knew all that. And here he was living as a human, living as a man, in a culture, in a particular time and space. And then he had to make some choices about how he was going to live, what he was going to do, what he was going to say, how he was going to say it, who he was going to say it to. And all of those decisions were about, were purposeful decisions. They were about, he was attempting to address the question you're attempting to address today, is how do I build these, this bridge, this bridge of understanding, this bridge of, of awareness, this bridge of knowledge. And the answer was he needed to adapt his teaching to the particular time and space that he was in. He needed to adapt it to the consciousness of the people that wanted to follow him. And it was interesting because his disciples were common salt of the earth people. They were not privileged people. They were not highly educated people. Obviously, that was not an accident. Nothing in his life was an accident. And so he taught in stories. He taught in metaphors. He taught in analogies because that was what those people could relate to. And so I think that principle, if you want to be a good bridge builder, you have to pay attention to the listening of the listener. You've got to get out of your own frame of reference enough what is present for you is not only the content of the, what the listener is saying, but you're also bringing into your awareness the listening of the listener, the background of relatedness, the listening of the listener, looking at how they're looking, listening to how they're listening. And we're not trained to do that in our culture. We're hypnotized to focus on content, and maybe a little bit on process, but how many of us are trained to focus on the context, the space? Not many. And so what I attempt to do when I'm with someone is to be out here, to be the space of the interaction, not to be in here, not to be over there, but to be out here, to be the space of the interaction, so that naturally what's part of my awareness is my listening to your listening. And so my commitment to being an effective educator or bridge builder, combined with my commitment and ability to be out here instead of in here or over there, naturally produces an awareness of your listening. And then my words and my tone and my, the way my body works then is in service and spontaneously emerges because I have the skill sets already. I have the skill sets of speaking, 
I have the skill sets of listening. I have the skill sets of moving my body. So those are all there for me already as part of my sense of who I am. So it's invisible to me. I don't have to pay attention to it. I've already done my homework. I've already been on the practice field practicing, but now it's game time. And so I'm not thinking about any of those things because the time to think about those things is when you're practicing on the practice field. But when you're in the game, if you're thinking about those things, you've already lost. But that has to become invisible. That has to become part of your beingness that is, is, is just who you are. And then you can be present with, with the kinds of things we're talking about. So I want to go back to being in the game. We opened the door, the, we opened the window for, for me about what I was being in relation to what I knowing, what could have been grist for the mill, could have spent a whole session on it, right? That's so, true. So let's say you and I, for the, again, for the listener out there, what if you and I would have spent a whole session on that? What would I have come away with? What would the results have been for me? How would I have, my, how would my life have changed if we would have gone through that process? Well, for one, there's no guarantee. I'm not responsible for your choices or your willingness to learn. I mean, that's probably the most important thing I could say. Is, so if not, I were willing to play with you wholeheartedly, and if I were really willing to know in a way that I hadn't been willing to know before, what might be possible then in the, that space of transformation? Well, again, there are other things to consider besides willingness. Okay. There's also what, your readiness. Okay. There's also the abilities that you bring to the conversation. Okay. So it's not a simple answer. Okay. And, and I need to factor that in. Okay. When I'm being with you. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it's going to influence the goal that I might have for you in that session. So this is really important what I'm saying right now. Is I've got to be so unattached to any agenda I might have other than to serve you. Mm -hmm that I'm aware of and sensitive to your readiness, ability, and willingness. Mm -hmm. I would say that's one of the most important things I could say there. And that I have no idea without knowing those things, I have no idea how to answer your question. So, okay. so that's probably the most important thing I could say. But that being said, one of the things you can go to the bank on is that all mastery begins with awareness. So I'm going to say that again. If you want to master something, if you want to realize mastery in relation to something, you can go to the bank on that way before you master your relationship to that thing, you have to become aware of that thing. So let's apply that principle that you can go to the bank on which I feel comfortable speaking about, and say, okay, what happened in that sentence completion and my, and my response to your sentence completion? Well, one thing that likely happened was you became aware of something you were not aware of before. You became aware that you were living a story called if I am you a, know something, it has something to do with my mother, and then I have to do something about it. Well, the, the, the key story there is that I am at the effect of knowing something. I'm being something that I had no idea I was being that maybe has been shaping and constraining my entire life. I've been being that... Knowledge has power over me. Well, anybody who's being that knowledge has power over them is going to be afraid of knowledge. Like, duh. You know? <laughs> so instead of swimming upstream and trying to 
deal with a person who is afraid of knowledge and trying to convince them that knowledge is cool, you might as well become a dentist and pull teeth. It's a lot easier to help them see that what they've been being is that knowledge dominates them. And that their life has been about avoiding the domination of more knowledge. Now that's powerful. That's powerful. And if you can become aware that a big part of your life has been about avoiding the domination of more knowledge, that opens up a whole new world. And it's likely that we probably would go down that road. And I would help that person for that to become real for them. And I would help them to get to the point of compassionate awareness, where they could accept themselves in the moment of that awareness. And they could accept that that's where they've been at. And then they could maybe move in the direction of taking responsibility that no matter who laid that trip on them when they were little, that in terms of it affecting them now, it's, it's in their mind. It's not in my mind. It's not in your mind. It's in their mind. And that's the good news, because if it was in my mind, it'd be hard for them to change it. <laughs> but if they, can, if they can let go of shame, blame, and guilt, and they can take responsibility, oh, this is in my mind. This is happening now. This, isn't, this is happening in my mind now. This isn't happening 30 years ago, 50 years ago. I don't have to wait for my mother to change, you know, like that. And then maybe they will forgive themselves for having been caught up in that box without knowing they've been caught up in that box. And maybe they'll forgive others who modeled that box. And maybe they'll ask others to forgive them for being part of that box. And maybe they'll be grateful for the opportunity to see the box because if you see the box, you're not in the box. And then maybe they'll make a new choice and um, be willing to experiment with living inside the possibility of, uh, you know, what if knowledge was simply a resource? So we'd probably go down that road as far as we could go. And then if we got stuck, we'd back off or we'd inquire differently or I might use a different technique or something. But the road from awareness to mastery is what it's all about. So you allow people, you give people the space and through your use of technology as a transformation and inquiry, to see what stories they have been as real that have been using their lives. Not just through technology. Technology is a tool. Okay. But it's also through the quality of my being, mm -hmm. the quality of my presence, mm -hmm. the, the stand that I am living in that moment. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy in our culture. We, get, we become hypnotized with technique. Mm -hmm. We give our power away to technique, but it's not about technique. Technique can be very helpful, but that's not the essential ingredient. And what is? Living this, living transformation, living, st living one stand and being present as one stand combined with caring, and courage and creativity, that's the essence. And then what is possible from the place of that stand? Anything. And one of the things that emerges are, are, are useful techniques. Whether you invent them or whether somebody shows them to you, but you know, if you give your power away to technique, that's giving your power away to structure. Just like the person in the role playing was giving their power away to knowledge. It's the same game. 
you know, it, it's not about technique. It's not about more information. It's not what it's about. And information can be really useful. And the right technique at the right time, in the right hands, in the right spirit, can be a godsend. But it's never about that. If you make it about that, now you're not living transformation anymore. And that's okay, because part of living transformation is realizing that you're not living transformation. <laughs> yep. Because remember, we're dealing with an infinite game. We're dealing with infinite spaciousness. And so this is a whole other world. This is a whole other way of being that most people don't know. They don't know about this. And therefore, they don't desire it in any kind of conscious way because consciously they don't know that they don't know about it. And so I think being in the presence of a person, I know for me, what really jacked me up and got me turned on and got my juices flowing was being in the presence of someone that was actually living and speaking transformation committedly. And it was like something inside me that had been asleep woke up and said, yeah, baby, you know, I, whatever they're smoking, I want some of that. You know, that, that living that way that's a game worth playing. And so that's what happened for me as a young man. I was in the presence of people that were living transformation and something lit up in me. And, you know, I think because of my particular soul uh, path and having many other uh, timeline experiences where I had already done a lot of healing and teaching work, that combined with the catalytic nature of being in the presence of someone who was living and being and speaking transformation that really lit the fire that still burns in me as we're speaking right now. And as far as I can tell, it never goes out. It's infinity. It's infinite. Yes. And yet the interesting thing about it is, is that it has a powerful impact in the everyday world of human beings, everyday concerns. It's not just mental masturbation. It's not just an interesting course in philosophy. Living transformation, although you're living in an infinite way, has a profound impact in what you and I would call the finite dimensions of what we would normally call human experience. It has a big impact on our experiential reality. It has a big impact on our circumstantial reality. It has a big impact on our impact on other people, the quality of our ideas, um, our vitality, our capacity for love. So it, it impacts a lot of things that the person living in the world is concerned about and cares about, but it's not of that world. So it's like we go back to the Master Jesus, right? When he talked about living in the world, but not of the world. Most people don't know what the heck he's talking about. This, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about living transformation. He's talking about living as an infinite being, having a human experience, and not giving your power away to finite structures. What has been the most powerful thing for me personally since consciously actively living in from the space of transformation is that I now get excited about stuff that irritates me really badly because I know that that's a place, that's an attachment, that's a story, that's a way of being that I am still attached to that is ripe for the healing. And you my, see my most gigantic breakthroughs have been when I have been in a really intense frustrating upsetting situation and then i've had space to stand back and say what am i being that's bringing this to me and doing that inquiry and going in there and doing that healing and coming out the other side and entirely well the same person but having a no whole new space of possibility for what can come to me because of what i was being that was creating that irritation exactly and for most people if the space of transformation or infinity is not part of their world, their experiential world, people will default into 
a life experience where there's pretty much only two different realms. Like if you were to do an honest interview with someone who isn't exposed to transformation, it's likely if you really did an interview with them and found out what was real for them, you'd find out that everything that was real for them fell into two categories. Either things that were real for them experientially, thoughts, feelings, memories, sensations, intuitions, moods, and things that were real for them in the circumstantial physical world. You know, they have this amount of money in the bank. They're, they're, they're inside their living room. They're talking on the phone. And if you're being that those are the only things that are real, which are, these are finite realms, right? Everything in the circumstantial world is finite. And everything that, every content in the experiential world is finite. A thought is finite. It doesn't last forever. Things in the circumstantial world, even a mountain, isn't going to last forever. And so, if, if, if your world is filled with things that are finite, you're going to conclude subconsciously that you are finite. And, and you won't see clearly because everything you see will be skewed by this unconscious story you have that everything is finite and you won't be able to see clearly. So for example, for, the, for most people, their stories don't occur to them as stories. They occur to them as, as what is. Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean when I talk about not being able to see clearly. And so... And that's Once, what happens for anyone in the space of having something that they haven't become aware of yet. They have a story that's real that they don't know is a story that's real for them. It's the water they're swimming in. Right. And so transformation is a discipline that allows one to build a bridge from where most people live to where you're living now, which is where your relationship to content has shifted mm -hmm. fundamentally, including the content called stories. So now you have a transformed relationship with stories mm -hmm. such as now instead of stories using you instead of stories having you you have your stories awesome. and you can start using stories in a purposeful way again if we go back to the master jesus one thing you see if you look at his life is he was a master at using stories Stories didn't use him. He used stories in a very purposeful way. So I'm validating and clarifying one thing you're saying. That one marker, one indicator of living transformation is a transformed relationship with one's stories. Mm -hmm. And by extension... It's a transformed relationship with any structure. Whether it be an internal structure, like a philosophical structure of thought, or whether it be an external structure, like your body, or like um, a, a recipe that you're following. You just stop giving your power away to structure, which is finite. You start... You stop giving your power away to things that are finite as you become more comfortable being the infinite being that you are, having a human experience, so you're interacting with structure all the time. And so it's not about rejecting structure. It's not about discounting structure. In fact, you respect structure more because you, you tell the truth about it. You tell the truth about what a structure can do and what it cannot do.
So you live inside a certain story and it gets you this far in life. But a story can only get you so far. And what most people do is a story gets them as far as they can, but instead of realizing, oh, I'm trapped inside a story that's gotten me as far as I can, what happens is people have no idea that that is what is happening. And so then what happens is, then they make up all these other stories about why they are the way they are, why others are the way they are, why life is the way it is, how their future's gonna be, how they're a victim of their fill in the blank, blah, 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 And so people start living inside more and more and more stories. And then they just, we call that getting older. We call, you know, we call that being reasonable. You know, and so you get all these people that are reasonable and right and miserable and old. <laughs> and then they try to get their kids to follow them. <laughs> and their kids go, I don't want to be like you. So anything's better than you. <laughs> okay, so this is a really good segue to the last question that I have for you is... So I've been part of the 12 step program, a 12 step program and the 12 step movement is gigantic on the planet right now. And there are certain people that start working with certain spiritual teachers. So basically for me, the 12 step program started my spiritual journey. And in the space of that, I was what, what I had been praying for healing and basically God brought me you. And it was because you kept coming to me three times. And I finally said, Oh my God, okay, this is what God wants for me. I'm going to listen. But so what would you say? I, so I hear about people on a regular basis and it just within my own spaces, I have, I have, I know I have addictions to a lot of different structures and the stories that use me, but there are people out there that start in the 12 step program and they hit the wall or maybe some people they get in a 12 step program and they've been in a 12 step program for 20 years and they've been clean and sober for 20 years. And then all of a sudden they go back even worse into a different right. drug I'm or something you. else. I'm with you. So, what would you say about that? I mean, yeah. Okay. So the first thing I would say is for people to realize that the 12 step program is a structure. I'm going to say that two more times. The 12 step program is a structure. The 12 step program is a structure. Okay. okay. And so if people giving their power away to a structure, eventually that's going to, cause a limitation. My experience is, is that most people who get a lot of value out of the 12-step program get the maximum value during the first four to five years. And I think that's because given where most people are when they enter into the 12-step program, I think the 12-step program is a very useful structure for facilitating healing for where most people are at when they enter the 12-step program. Um, it embodies qualities of community, of humility, of emotional honesty, of, um, of uh, repentance. Uh, it embodies a lot of uh, eternal virtues. However, first of all, it's a structure. Secondly, there is an inherent limitation in the ontology of the philosophy. The first, the first step is you are declaring as a being, you are declaring that you are an alcoholic, which is not true. At the level of ontological truth, it is not true. So since it's based on something that is experientially true and circumstantially true, 
but not absolutely true. It's not a structure that will allow you to play the master game because it's not based on infinity. It's a finite game that embodies, that tries to include infinite qualities, but it suffocates it because it's in an ontological context of a finite game. It's based on a lie ontologically. And because it's based on a lie, it's going to have limitations. And at a certain point, someone is, if they don't recognize that there's ontological limitations to the fundamental philosophy and structure of the 12-step program, they're going to not be able to continue to grow if they've continued to give their power away to that structure. And they won't know that they're doing that. And so they'll ultimately get frustrated and then they'll go back to their addiction. Okay, thank you. So I, thank you. And I keep hearing the word ontology. What does that mean? It's the study of being, what we're being. So if you declare to the universe, I am, which is being, I, to be, I am, if you're declaring I am an alcoholic, the universe is going to go, okay. The universe is going to go, okay, whatever you say. So now you're being an alcoholic going through the 12-step program. You're being an alcoholic. You're being an alcoholic going through the 12-step program. And that seems to work pretty well for the first four or five years. But then when it stops working, instead of people going, well, gee, maybe there's some structural limitations here. No, people have given their power away to the 12 steps. They've turned it into a false god. They feel ashamed that they're not growing anymore. They don't know how to be with that. And so they go, they go do something silly. So inherently... What I'm hearing is inherently there are a lot of amazing infinite qualities, as you say, but a, an inherent shift would be I am infinity having a human experience. So within the context, being, having, I am an infinite, I'm an infinite being having a human experience. And in my human experience, I'm currently in a condition where I've so given my power away to alcohol that Alcohol has, is dominating my human experience okay. to the point where my, I feel out of control. I don't trust my own, I'm not trusting my own mind right now. I'm not trusting my own choices. This would be a statement that would honor the infinite realm, the experiential realm, and the circumstantial realm. Thank you, which are the places that you work from. So I'm going to repeat that. There's the infinite realm, in which it allows for everything, the space, which is the space of everything. And then within the infinite realm, people have circumstances and people have experiences. And then to the, ex and then to the extent that people may be used by their ego, then circumstances or experiences they are constant avoiding the domination of fighting being fought by blah 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 because they give their power away to circumstances and experiences because they think they are their circumstances and experiences it's deeper than they think they are they are, they are that, they, that are. they are it's not something they think about no unless it is it is unless you're weird like me it's not something you think about no it is it's what it's what is true they're being that, that that is so without knowing yes. that they're being that that is so. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I feel that if you can take what I'm sharing with you and you can internalize it to the point where you don't have to think about it anymore, mm -hmm. where you really work it through to the point where you're living it, and you, with or without my assistance, you bring this to the 12-step community. The impact you can have on this world is mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. Because, <laughs> because I'll bet you, even though I'm no expert on the recovery literature world, 
I'll bet you that there have been thousands of books, at least hundreds of books written that are attempting to get at what we got at today. Because you and I aren't the first people to notice that something's not quite right here. And the power of the distinctions that we were using to speak about this provides a level of clarity about the nature of the problem and the nature of the solution that may be new to the field of recovery. But you could speak to that much better than I could. Well, yeah, I, I was lucky enough to within my first six months of starting Adult Children of Alcoholics to have attracted you into my life. So I feel as though God gave me the biggest gift I could ever have because I was being an introduced to being an adult child of an alcoholic at the same time as I was introduced to being with you, an ontological and spiritual guide. Right. And so even though I was going through the 12 step program, I was coming, I was doing the 12 steps of ACA within you, within the framework that you were providing me for. Right. I, I was, I was coming at it from, I am an infinite being having a human experience and I was doing all of the steps and da, 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 da. And then honestly, about four years in, I, I was done. I was, you know, I, I had gotten what I thought I could have gotten from it. And also within that time, I had one foot on the dock and one foot on the boat. And I wasn't willing to let go of the me that I thought that I was. So I was in such extraordinary physical pain that I wanted to kill myself. <laughs> because... I was in, so I mean, it was just, it was untenable. Um, and, and within that, it, within that period of, you know, three months that I was literally consciously contemplating how am I, you know, what, how would I get out of my body? I was living within the fantasy of if I left my body, I would feel better. And then when the one day I called you and you said, well, you know, just because you leave your body doesn't mean you're going to feel better. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I closed that fantasy off. And, I, and then a couple months later, I consciously made a decision that I wanted to feel better. I was done with, I really wanted things to feel better. So there was a conscious decision that I was done living that way. I was no longer willing to live in the extreme pain that I was going in. And it was actually in the framework of my relationship with my husband, because I lived on the couch for two years. It was pretty bad. I was basically getting up and going to work. And that was about it. I was living death. And in retrospect, what I realized had happened to me was that I made a decision as an adult, uh, as a baby in the horrible circumstances that I lived in, that it was my job to take on everybody's reality around me in order to make things better. So I was in a situation where I was working with a bunch of people with energy, which would, would, wasn't compatible with the stand I was taking on, that I had taken on all of their stories. And the longer and the longer and the longer I was in there, the worse, I, the more closed in I got. So, you know, I made a decision. Things were going to change. You've always consciously said to me, follow your joy, follow your joy, follow your joy. And as I've continued to follow my joy and live my, when I, when my soul says, Whoa, go do it, I've done it. And from the date that I finally said, okay, I'm willing to die to the me that I think I am. It's like, it's been a radical spiritual awakening. Prior life stuff, to the extent that I was, me and I was living in Satan's world. To me and my world, love was hate. So that's part of what was scary for me. It takes a lot of courage to, you know, we're social animals. We're social animals in many ways. 
we're mammals in that way. And the herd instinct is very strong. The fear of abandonment, of social ostracism is very, very deeply genetically rooted. And to be willing to break away from structures and environments and communities that no longer serve you does take a leap of faith and that's one of the reasons it's so important to not only have a living teacher if you are blessed and to have a, a teaching that's rooted in truth with a capital T but another reason why it's so important to have connections with fellow travelers on the path that are at a similar level of consciousness to where you are because it's maybe one in 10,000 people that have the wiring that they would be willing to let go of their communities mm -hmm. without having any sense of a new community. And this feeling of being all alone is, um, is something that needs to be looked at and uh, one of the things that I've always attempted to do if I'm going to be working with people at this level is to be aware of when it could be useful to connect one of my students with other students or to form a community uh, that can provide that kind of sangha type support. So... Um, it's a natural desire of people once they reach a certain level of transformational living to want to spend more time with other people that are living transformation without making anybody wrong or judging anybody it's just a natural desire that i've observed and actually, I want, I, so I have two questions to ask you. One, I'm conscious of the fact that our interview is already probably like 95 minutes long. So why don't we wrap it up within the next five to seven minutes? Okay, because I do. So what you're saying is, is another question that I have. So you talk about, because you've talked about transformation at the level of individual relationships, groups and organizations and culture. And I'm wondering what do you, so do you know of individuals, groups, and systems that you would recommend to people that are consciously on the transformational path? To I, I, make, I tend to make those recommendations on a very individual basis okay. due to where they are at and their interests and their nature. Okay. One thing I think that might make a really interesting second interview, if you're interested and when you're ready, would be to do a second interview that focuses more specifically on transformation and its uh, implications at the level of culture. <laughs> yes, I think we started talking about that yesterday. So yes, I would love to do that. Okay, is there anything you want to say in closing before you turn it back over to me to close out the show? Uh, what I wanted to ask you for was basically as a wrap, but first I want to thank you so much for the wealth of juicy stuff that's in this interview. I think the listener will get so much from it. But I would like to ask you to wrap up if you had two or three sentences to sum up your work, benefits, results of you as a you and the space of transformation or whatever you feel guided to share. Would you be willing to do that? Yeah, I would say instead of doing that, I think what I'm guided to say is that um, I'd encourage you to listen to this or watch this three or four times because, you know, I know one of the intentions Maureen and I had for this interview was to give you, a, not just talk about transformation, but to give you a taste of it. And so I would say, do that. And then if you're interested in uh, pursuing a more formal relationship with me, you can contact me in different ways. You can go to my podcast website at www.cuttingedgedoc.com. That's cuttingedgedoc.com. You can go to my private practice website at davidkamnitzer.com. That's David, K-A-M as in Mary, 
and is in Nancy, I-T-Z-E-R, at gmail.com. I'm also on Facebook under David Kamnitzer, and um, we can get into communication and see if it's appropriate for us to have some mutually beneficial connection. But I would say the, the, the main thing I would say is just to direct you to your direct experience of the quality of Maureen's beingness, my beingness, the quality of the conversation, the power of the conversation, and see if it lights you up. And if it does, and you're moved to take some action to get to know me better, or to get to know Maureen better. Maybe Maureen, you'd like to give some of your contact information, and then I'll close out the show. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so thank you. So I just want to thank you so much, Dr. David, for allowing me to do this interview. It was hugely helpful to me as an individual and the collective about transformation. My name is Maureen Xavier, M-A-U-R-I-N-E, last name X-A-V-I-E-R. I am on Facebook. My email address is my name, Maureen Xavier at gmail.com. And my cell phone number is 650-280-4378. Well, thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening or watching, you've been listening or watching to a special, you've been listening or watching a special edition of Freeing the Body, Freeing the Soul, where we do in-depth interviews with individuals that are doing cutting-edge work in the areas of healing, spirituality, social transformation. And today's been a turn-the-table show where myself, Dr. David, has been interviewed by my friend and my student, Maureen Xavier, and the topic has been transformation. So with that, we'll close with love and peace. Bye for now.